Well, hello and welcome back to the channel. I'm Richard and this is Lap of the World, your home for road trips and race tracks. Now, without too much further ado, we will pick up where we left off in the last video. For those who didn't watch that video in which I used the, uh, my NSX as a point of comparison to kind of validate my butt dyno as well as confirm the suspicions that I had that my bull back here is not raging as hard as it should, I will quickly summarize where we are in the process. After kind of generally getting used to the car, I guess, having now owned it for a little over a year, uh, I kind of started having suspicions that the sluggish low RPM performance wasn't just a, a fact of life, so to speak. I kind of watched some other you know, reviews of the car that were in period when it was new, uh, as well as more recent content from people who owned these early cars. And I was like, mine doesn't sound or do like that when you get on the gas at 3,000 RPM. It takes it a second to kind of get on its horse, and then it'll go. But that mid-RPM range was a little bit unsatisfying. So did the did a comparison test in which I objectively showed that it is currently slower than my NSX between 40 and 60 miles an hour, at least, uh, which should not be the case given the relative vehicle weights and torque curves. Uh, as such, I started in the troubleshooting process and did a bunch of research. Uh, now, the car is not throwing any codes. As some people have mentioned, often the, uh, in fact, I had this actually with my NSX a long time ago, uh, a bad coil pack can kind of do this type of thing where you get an um, inconsistent misfire. Well, in this case, the plugs and coils are both new. Uh, they were replaced, possibly not coincidentally, right before I bought the car. Um, <laughs> maybe an effort to mask this other issue. Uh, it is also not throwing any... Um, uh, whatever you call them, any check engine codes. Uh, so it's not EVAP, it's not electrical, or it's very unlikely to be electrical, which kind of leaves us with air and fuel. Now, uh, <laughs> I have had the air filters out of the car, so I did confirm that they are not installed upside down or clogged or anything dumb like that, which comes back around to fuel. Now, the low-hanging fruit, which is what we're doing today, or what we're trying first at least, are the fuel filters. Uh, they are relatively inexpensive and... Although they are a little bit tedious, as you will see, uh, they are not all that high up the difficulty level for a competent DIYer. So that's what we're gonna be doing today. We're attempting the fuel filters, and then we will test it to see if that fixes it. If it does, great. We have fixed our car for, I think, a total cost of like 60 bucks. Um, if it doesn't fix it, then we're looking at $600 a piece for fuel pumps. Uh, if that is where the issue is and not a restriction upstream, downstream. But, uh, so fingers crossed there, but let's get into the task at hand. Wasting no time, start with the usual pre-work of disconnecting the battery, and since we're dealing with fuel, grab a fire extinguisher if one isn't already nearby, and maybe open a window or your garage door. Once you're situated, step one is to remove the plastic shrouds at the back and sides of the engine compartment. I had already removed the front trim panel as well, but that is not necessary for this job. You will need to remove the engine lid struts to take off the side panels, and you may as well leave them loose for the time being and use a suitable prop instead. Starting on the driver's side, the next step is to remove the charcoal canister or EVAP canister. Dealing with a charcoal canister may be the most difficult part of the whole operation, if I'm honest. The airlines can be cantankerous and the canister itself is somewhat shoehorned in place. Start by removing the airlines, but note or take a picture of the way that they overlap each other as that will be important for reassembly. I found one of the most difficult parts of this entire operation to me was removing these vacuum fittings from the charcoal canister. Now the proper technique for this, I think, after some experimentation, is you have to kind of go backwards to go forwards. So, you rather, uh, while these things are on, you push them down, pinch very strongly on these panels on the side right here, and then pull straight back out or pry a little bit. Uh, this one I actually had to kind of pry with a screwdriver just a little bit. You just want to be very careful to pry or pull straight out and don't try and wiggle or bend because uh, you then run the risk of breaking off, uh, you know, either damaging the fitting or damaging the charcoal canister. And if you break off one of these nipples, then uh, it gets expensive. Next, undo the two bolts holding the retaining bracket in place, then shimmy, slide, and wiggle the canister out of its location. With the canister removed, we now have access directly to the fuel filter. If you want to avoid a gas bath, order of operations is going to be important going forward. 
First, loosen the screw on the retaining bracket, slide the filter inboard a little, and then disconnect the quick connector on the outboard side. For me, this connector was far easier than those on the charcoal canister. Your mileage may vary. You should not have much, if any, fuel spillage from that connection. Now, finish removing the screw from the retaining bracket and slide the fuel filter out. Leave the inboard fitting and line connected. Position a suitable catch container under the fuel filter and then undo the second fitting. You can now expect a measurable volume of fuel to spill out of both the line and the filter itself. So as I was removing the driver side filter, one thing I did notice was that the paint match marks on the fasteners and indeed on the filter itself were unbroken. Uh, they were still lined up and the paint was still kind of flowed together. And that is either the work of a very anal dealer mechanic or more than likely the factory, which would imply that as I kind of suspected, these may never have been replaced before. And they are now more than double their uh, recommended service interval. So again, hopefully this is more credence to the theory of these being the problem, although, again, the proof will be in the pudding at the end. Using new gasket washers, transfer the outboard nipple to the new filter, connect the new filter to the inboard fuel line, and continue the reverse process, but do not reinstall the charcoal canister yet. Moving to the passenger side, I was able to accomplish this without draining the coolant tank, although if you are not accustomed to working blind, you have the option of draining the tank and removing it. Undo the rear bracket bolt and simply slide the expansion tank rearward and out of your way. Next, remove the forward bracket and you should now be able to reach the passenger side filter. Repeat the same steps and sequence of disconnecting, draining, hardware swapping, and reinstallation. Again, on this side, do not yet reinstall the expansion tank. Now, with the filters in place, but the charcoal canister and expansion tank still out of the way, reconnect the battery and turn the key on to the accessory position, or the accessory two position, which should cause the fuel pumps to prime without turning the engine over. Now that the fuel system is under pressure, carefully check for leaks. If none exist, then you can reinstall the charcoal canister and expansion tank at this point. All right, so it is the following day, uh, and what I have done is actually run a little bit of an extended test, which is why this took more than a day to complete. I don't think the actual exercise of changing out the filters should be more than a long afternoon, but I was being extra cautious, uh, and here's why. So before I reassembled everything, I left uh, critically the, before I put the charcoal canister back in and before I moved the coolant tank back into its original position, uh, and this will work as long as you didn't drain the coolant tank, in which case you'll have another step. But what I did is before I had those things put back in their original positions, I reconnected the battery and then turned the car to its accessory, like pre-start position, so that the fuel pumps would prime and pressurize all of my new connections that I've done here. Uh, actually, in my case, when I did that the first time, I did on the passenger side have a small leak on the outboard fitting. I took that back apart, reapplied a new crush washer to it, uh, put that back together again, um, <laughs> just kind of checking to make sure that all of the uh, mating surfaces were clean, and then I re-ran the test and got no leaks at that point. To be extra cautious, I then uh, did the same thing, actually cranked it over, uh, not actually turned the car on, but I got the engine to like sort of um, crank a couple times, you know, spin it a couple times, uh, to sort of add some extra pressure in there. And then I left it for, uh, well, whatever, I say 24 hours. I left it overnight uh, with paper towels wrapped around each of the fittings so that if I came out here today and any of the paper towels were wet, then I would know I might have had a slow leak that I needed to go and chase. Uh, fortunately, it seems to have passed that test. None of the paper towels were wet and uh, none of any of the areas around. So, uh, that is where we are. I have now reassembled fully or reinstalled fully the coolant tank and the charcoal canister. I have procured my trusty uh, fire extinguisher. I borrowed this from the NSX since I don't have one uh, specifically for the Lamborghini yet. So this will be accompanying me on all of our shenanigans today because better safe than sorry. But, <laughs> but
But yeah, so I think at this point we are ready to fire it up for the first time and then take it for a drive and see if we fixed anything or not. That's another sort of side note consideration, I guess, is that you probably want to fire everything up, get it warmed up and drive it before you put all of the trim pieces back on because with those side trim pieces off, you can actually directly see with a flashlight both ends of each fuel filter to see, uh, you know, be able to visually confirm that there are no drops or drips or anything like that. Uh, hopefully, certainly no uh, big fountains or sprays, but uh, yeah, so, I'm going to get this resituated and then we are going to go for a drive and we'll see what happens. All right, so we are out on the road and we are approaching the moment of truth here. Now I will be finding out as you find out. I have not pedaled it or done anything uh, to throw off our uh, to throw off our test. So I will be uh, <laughs> I am as curious as you are at this point. It's worth noting it's a few degrees cooler, but uh, not very much. Uh, still hot today so all right we're in third gear just under 3,000 rpm 40 miles an hour coming up to our start point and sixty. I honestly can't tell it's uh, you know not doing it back to back is always a little bit rough but uh, I felt like it did not fall as hard on its face as that, as, at that time as it did before. Um, that said, it didn't really like uh, pin me to the seat like I might expect uh, 500 horsepower to do, but uh, <laughs> we shall, uh, we'll put it against the other two in a video overlay and we'll see if it made any difference. Well, crap baskets. Uh, <laughs> what are you gonna do but laugh at this point? Uh, sometimes it just can't be easy. So uh, yeah, there was a marginal improvement, but it was marginal at best. And driving the car around on the way home, it definitely still falls on its face at low RPM under heavy throttle. Uh, you know, again, I kind of I got home and I was like, I need to validate my perceptions versus reality. So I got on YouTube as you know, one is want to do. And uh, I went back and I watched every kind of POV review I could find of early Gallardos, the 2004, 2005 cars from pretty much everybody that's anybody that's ever driven or owned one of these on the internet. Uh, I watched some of JM's drive of that uh, burgundy colored car at the airfield. Yeah, it's when I pull this left hand I got a little warning like, I mean, they're gonna fix that. Uh, full power. Five, six, seven, that's 80 already. This car shifts. You know, some, I think uh, Hoovy's car, his blue car, I believe, was an 05, question mark, um, which should be a similar. It might be an 06, I'm not sure about that, but I watched some of his too. And I even went back, you know, watched five or six year old Vehicle Virgins videos from his first Gallardo. Um, you know, understanding that car was maintained by some professional somewhere. So that's how desperate I was. But uh, yeah, it, it seems that all accounts point to car still slower than it should be, which leads us to probably the fuel pumps. Um, the fuel filters, you know, they seem to have helped, didn't fix it. Fuel pumps are next, I guess. Now I haven't gone and actually done any digging or research on that. It could be tragic. Uh, it could be I may need to drop the tanks. I don't know how I'll do that, but I might just end up buying a lift because that might be cheaper than paying somebody to do that. Um, or uh, if I'm lucky, there's some access panels to them. And then also I have not looked, I know the Lamborghini list price for those is about 600 bucks a piece, but I have not also done the research to see if they cross reference to some Audi. You know, that's the nice thing with these cars is you can cross your fingers and flip a coin. Sometimes you get lucky, 
I don't know if I will be yet. We will find out. If you have any tips or leads, leave them in the comments, please. But that is where we're going to leave it today. I hope you've been entertained. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, hopefully the walkthrough was helpful on how to do the filters. Uh, and if that wasn't, then at least maybe you got some little schadenfreude lift out of it or something like that. But uh, that's where we're going to leave it for today. So I'm Richard. This is still Lap of the World. And I will see you guys in the next video, if not at the track.